Of all the artifacts that were aboard the good ship Mayflower, not a single gun is known to have survived. But historians believe they were probably there, accompanying the pilgrims to Plymouth Rock. Guns are so woven into the fabric of our founding that on the fourth floor of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, they have their very own vault. I'm sure there's people that would give anything to come in here and see these things, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I get lots of visitors who are just astounded and don't want to leave. David Miller is the curator here. He's got guns of all shapes and sizes and calibers. Which cannon? Ooh, that one is probably from Russia. And every one has a historic reason for being here. This is the type of weapon that would have been used at Lexington or Concord. It's not the gun that kicked off the revolution with that shot heard around the world, but it's similar. The musket is now in every history book. It's come to symbolize freedom and independence, even celebrated on Broadway in the smash hit Hamilton. Guns are just part of our everyday language. Going off half cocked, flash in the pan, bite the bullet. They're all rooted in firearms lore. But were we really born? a gun culture. Oliver Historian Pamela Haig says, not necessarily. Listen to how many sentences begin with something like, Americans have always, they have always loved guns, they have always had guns. These things are much more complicated than that. The meanings of guns have changed. In her book, The Gunning of America, Haig says most settlers viewed the gun as a tool, as necessary and yet as ordinary as a plow or an ax. We think we have a gun culture because of this special, exceptional status with guns, but really, commercially, the gun was extremely unexceptional. It was very much treated like any other commodity. At the start of the Revolutionary War, we didn't even have enough arms to outfit the Continental Army. Today, however, it's estimated we have more guns than people. So how did we get from there to here and here? The gun industry is not the only reason that we got here. However, it is the reason that never gets talked about. It's not just a matter of salesmanship, but gun industrialists like Oliver Winchester and Samuel Colt did their level best to create a market for their wares. Out of their factories in Connecticut, what came to be known as Gun Valley, they would soon produce firearms with the same speed and efficiency as Henry Ford would later do with the automobile. Best known, the Winchester 73, and the Colt Single Action Army Revolver, two of the guns that won the West. But as the frontier disappeared, so did the desire of many Americans to own a gun. These guns were not just selling themselves, they weren't just flying off the, the shelf. So by the 20th century, gun makers started to market their guns, not just as a tool, but a feeling. What was once needed now had to be loved. <laughs> there was a strong appeal to the young, too, and the notion of the gun as a rite of passage. One of the more interesting ads said, you know your boy wants a gun. You just don't know how much. He can't tell you. It's beyond words. <laughs> For parents worried about real guns, there were catalogs full of toy ones. A must have. Oh, there it is. Immortalized in what is now a Christmas classic. The Red Ryder 200 shot range model air rifle. It resembled the iconic rifles of the Wild West. And nothing romanticized the gun better than the cowboy. From real life legends like Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp, and Annie Oakley, to Hollywood immortals like John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart. The gun came to represent the rugged individualism of the untamed West. As the good guys and bad guys changed, so did the guns. Say hello to my little friend. Some became as famous as the stars who fired them. Go ahead, make my day. We do take our guns seriously, owning them as a constitutional right. But we've also tried to legislate how to control them. Americans have always had mixed feelings about guns. So for as much as the gunslingers are part of our heritage, so too is uh, disquiet and discomfort with guns. Even in the supposed Wild West, Towns like Tombstone and Dodge City prohibited people from carrying guns in public. FDR signed the first federal gun control legislation in 1934, 
hoping to reduce the number of bootlegging gangsters armed with Tommy guns and the like. Then fast forward three decades. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. John F. Kennedy's assassination, along with Robert Kennedy and the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., led President Lyndon Johnson to push through the Gun Control Act of 1968. We have been through a great deal of anguish uh, these last few months and these last few years. Too much anguish to forget. Too much anguish back then. But what about now? The shooting at an Orlando nightclub in June was the worst mass shooting in modern history. Weeks later, in Dallas, police were ambushed during a Black Lives Matter protest. In both cases, the guns were bought legally. In fact, incidents like that tend to spur the sales of even more guns. In the year after the Sandy Hook massacre, U.S. gun makers produced nearly 11 million firearms. Not far from Sandy Hook, in Hartford, Connecticut, sits a church built by Samuel Colt's widow. It stands as a unique symbol of where guns sit in our culture today. Because mixed in with the cherubs and the saints, you'll find her husband's firearms as art on the walls mingling with the ivy, hidden at the top of the church's columns. And maybe that's the place guns will always occupy, worshipped by many, their presence carved in stone.